Check.
the one thing I, Ben already probably shared, but I changed what input the pulp is in. Yeah, yeah. No, because I had to move the pulpit over. So. Anyway, just thought I'd, we're good? Okay, yeah, we'll see. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this time of worship at Alliston Christian Reformed Church. My name is Brittany Salverta, and I am one of the pastors here. And I am so glad to be here. And I am so glad that you are here. We, together, get to do something together this morning that is so, so important. We gather. We gather. We gather in the name of Jesus and by the power of his Holy Spirit in order to be renewed and the redemptive healing work of God. That's what we are doing here today. So welcome. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you worship with us regularly, you know that God renews us and does his redemptive healing work in our lives uh, through a, a few typical activities that we do together on a Sunday morning, like singing songs, praying prayers, and especially hearing God's word together. But today, something additional will be happening during our worship service. We get to do a baptism. While it is Freya's baptism, God will use it to bless all of us who are gathered here, to remind each of us that because of Jesus the Son, God the Father forgives, redeems, heals, and welcomes us into his family forever. So we look forward to that. One last thing to mention is that we will be hosting an extra midweek worship opportunity this coming Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. It's a quieter, smaller, simpler worship service that we do here occasionally at Alliston Christian Reformed Church, and we call it simply Space for God. Now, this Wednesday's Space for God is special in that it is on Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday, which is this week, is the very first day of the season of Lent. Lent is that season in the church year where Christians, in preparation for Good Friday and for Easter, are more intentional about remembering their deep, deep need for a Savior. And Space for God will be reflecting that. So that's Wednesday night at 7.30. You are welcome to come. With all that being said, why don't you stand up, please? Let's quiet ourselves before God and prepare ourselves for worship by saying a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for gathering us together. Thank you for promising to meet us here. We pray that in all we do together over this next hour, that you would do your work in our midst. Remove distraction. Speak your word to us loudly and clearly. And through that, Lord, apply your grace, your forgiveness, your redemption, 
and your healing to our lives that we might live our lives before you in truth and in power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. People of God, as we begin, receive now God's greeting for you. Grace to you and peace to you, beloved. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Father who created you, in the name of the Son who saved you, and in the name of the Spirit who is with us all here now. Amen. I invite you to just take a moment and extend a word of greeting with those around you.
at this time, is this working? Tim, check, one, two. I think it's working. At this time, we have the opportunity to witness and participate in something that is truly special, the baptism of Freya Rose Weisheisen. Before ascending into heaven, Jesus gathered his disciples to himself, and he said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This mission of baptizing and discipling and teaching, it's central to who we are as Christ's church. Our prayer, our desire, our hope is that all people would come into a life-giving discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ. Baptism is the right that marks the beginning of one's life with Christ. It's a sign and it's a seal that helps us understand the grace of God and the contours of the gospel more clearly. In baptism, we remember the good news that uh, just as water washes away dirt, so too has the blood of Jesus washed away all our sins. In baptism, we also see something being enacted, something portrayed. It, it points to and it conveys our spiritual union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Just as Jesus died and rose again, so too do we understand ourselves to be a people that have died with Christ and have risen with Christ. The waters of baptism point to this reality. Baptism is also a mark that sets one apart as a member of God's covenant family. In the Reformed tradition, which is our uh, Christian stream of, of faith and practice, we baptize believers and their children we, because we believe that ever since the beginning, God has graciously included children in his covenant of grace. This is true in the Old Testament through the sign of circumcision, and it's also true in the New Testament through the sign of baptism. Jesus himself invited the children to come to him. Do not turn them away, he said, for to such as these belong the kingdom of heaven. So today Freya is joining the community that has received God's grace in Christ and has responded with faith. And we pray that one day she will come to accept the God of her parents and the faith of her community. People of God, Many of you have gone through these waters yourself. Remember today your baptism. Mike and Kim, I'd like to invite you to come forward at this time. And your family can come too. Today, in addition to baptizing Freya, uh, I also want to just officially welcome you and your family into our community here at ACRC. Uh, at a council meeting recently, uh, we activated the Vice Citizens membership, and so they are officially members in our community again. Uh, it's so good to be on the journey with you, to be following Christ with you. Welcome. Well, clap, yes, sure. Today, uh, you stand before us, having brought Freya to receive the sacrament of baptism. I ask you, therefore, before God and the church to answer these questions and so profess your faith. Do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you promise to instruct Freya in the truth of God's word, in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, to pray for her, to teach her to pray, and to train her in Christ's way by your example, through worship and in the nurture of this church. What is your answer? We do. God help us. 
Thanks be to God. Congregation gathered here, I invite you to stand. This life of following after Christ, it's not just an individual uh, activity, but it's a group effort. We're in this together. And so I'd like you to promise to support Freya and this family on their journey. And this is the question I have for you this morning. Do you hear promise to love, encourage, and support Freya and her family by, by teaching them the gospel of God's love, by being an example to them of Christian faith and character, and by giving them the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? Congregation, what is your answer? Thank you. You may be seated. You, you guys have the support of this community. Please join me in prayer. We give you thanks, O holy and gracious God, for the gift of water. In the beginning of creation, your spirit moved over the waters. In the waters of the flood, you destroyed evil. And you led Israel, both the old and the young, through the Red Sea to freedom on the other side. And Jesus Christ, you are our living water, the one who opens the way up to everlasting life in the kingdom of God. We thank you today, Lord God, for the gift of baptism. And we pray now that you would pour out your Holy Spirit so that through this water, Freya may be washed clean and marked out as one of your own. We pray this in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Freya Rose, For you, Jesus Christ, came into the world. For you, he suffered and died, forgiving your sins. For you, he rose again, conquering death. All this he did for you, though you know nothing of it as yet. And so the word of Scripture is fulfilled. We love because God first loved us. Freya Rose by Sison, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to the cleansed and renewed family of God. This would be a good time to clap too, I think. <laughs> We want to pray with you now, and for Freya, of course, especially, but for your whole family. And it's so good, uh, Wesley and Lincoln, that you're up here to share in this today, too. Let's take a moment and pray for God's blessing on this family. Let's pray. Oh, loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bicehizen family, for Mike and Kim, for Wesley and Lincoln, for little Freya. We're so glad, Lord, to be journeying with them at this stage of their life. Thank you for bringing them to us. And I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would so fill them that they would be strengthened for all the things that lie ahead, all the, the needs they have as a family, physical, but also spiritual as well. May you encourage them each and every day. May you give them strength each and every day. And may you give Mike and Kim especially wisdom to be parents to these children, and especially today for Freya. And we're so grateful for this gift of a daughter. And we pray, Lord Jesus, now that um, you would bless Freya and continue to minister your grace in her heart and in her mind all the days of her life. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to respond by singing a song together, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And as we sing, Mike's going to chauffeur Freya around our church. And just so you can have a, a closer look and welcome her. At the end of the service, there won't be a receiving line or anything like that. So this is your opportunity just to welcome the sister into our fellowship. You may, you, let's stay seated and uh, we'll sing together.
Testing, testing, all right, we're on. Welcome guys, it's great to see you. Now we're about to go into a time of hearing God's word. Come on up girls. God's word will be proclaimed up here. God's word will be proclaimed in our Sunday school rooms. And in God's word we hear one main thing. God saves us, he redeems us, he heals us through Jesus Christ our Lord. In order to prepare to receive God's word, we're going to use the words of this song. And as usual, I invite you to follow me with the actions. Can you guys see me? Sebastian and Peter, Emery, good. Can everyone see me? So we're gathered here again today as a congregation. It's called Congregational it's Prayer. Left once you get I think I'm getting some feedback here about that. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, we're here as a congregation, not just to pray for each other, but to pray for our community, our country, and the world. And right now, there's a lot of stuff going on in our community, in our country, in the world. And there's some really tough things. Some of the stuff that I'd like to share with you are here and far away in our congregation. And some of you may remember Judy. Judy Hunter is the last name I had. Correct me if I'm wrong, Klaus. Okay. Her husband died suddenly. Matter of fact, in his sleep, she woke up and he was dead. That's pretty bad and pretty sad and very scary. And uh, I think some of you remember her name. She used to come here and was quite involved with the church. Um, Klaus, you're going to have to help me out other names. I know it was Hunter. Right. Right. Faulkner. Right. So some of you still will remember her. So we'll pray for her. Pretty sad moment in her life, for sure. Kate Vanderzag, her brother, had a very severe fall, and he's in really serious condition. As a matter of fact, um, there could be irreparable brain damage because of the fall. So we just ask that we just hold him in your prayers. It's a, a very difficult moment for the family, so please bear with him in your prayers. 
The other thing, too, is uh, some of you remember Ralph Braden. He has worshipped with us on occasion. Um, he's got a skin rash that has covered his entire body, and it's very painful and very disabilitating, too. So please bear uh, Ralph in prayer. He's come many times here with his wife. He's joined us in men's Bible study, uh, so I'm sure, and you know he's quite a person in the community, has written a number of books as well. So please pray for Ralph. Um, we continue to pray for Kyle Hayhoe. Remember, we had prayer for him a couple of weeks ago. Um, he's still really struggling, 19-year-old. Um, things are not all that good yet, so continue to hold him and his family in prayer. People from the local area here. The other thing is that, uh, just as a reminder, there's going to be a day of prayer, World Day of Prayer on Friday. Just as a reminder, I don't think it was in the bulletin, but it is something we should try to remember. There are all kinds of links to our Christian Reformed website that you can go on as well, and that we will be celebrating a World Day of Prayer on Friday individually. Finally, of course, Ukraine. Um, Pretty tough when you see these people just struggle and and just the animosity that's going on. I will be ending my prayer by a pastor from the Resonate that we have in our church. I will end my prayer with his prayer, but I just want you and beg you to keep that nation in your in your hearts and prayers. Let's pray. Lord, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our every thought. And Father, as we come to you this morning, we who live in such a privileged country, we who live in a privileged area of the world, we who have everything, we have food, we have clothing, we have shelter, we have friends, we have a church that we can go to. We can pray freely. Lord, we can witness a little baby being baptized and being given to you. We can watch our children sing and praise to you. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we have. But Lord, I also understand that with that privilege comes responsibility. And Lord, as our hearts go out to those around us, we just think of those. We think of the people that we've just mentioned in our prayer, Lord. We think of, of Judy, who just lost her husband, Lord, just waking up and he's gone. Father, just be with her in her time of sorrow in the family. Lord, what a difficult time that would be. Lord, I pray especially for Kate Vanderzag's brother. Lord, um, it's just a serious thing. His name's Robin, Lord, and we just ask that you would just hold him in the palm of your hand. And Lord, if there's healing, we ask that you would grant healing. And if there's mercy and grace needed, then we ask for that. Lord, you are the King of Kings, and we know that there's nothing impossible with you. And we ask, Lord, that you would just be with that family and that you would be there close to them. Lord, we continue to oh, we continue to pray for Kyle, Lord, a young man who at 19 years of age is really, really ill, and we ask that you be with him. Not a member of our church, but a member of the community, Lord, and as we extend that prayer outreach for those that are in our community and our country. Lord, I ask that you'll be with us too as we celebrate, and if we celebrate the prayer, prayer on Friday, Lord, where we pray for the world, where we pray for each other. Lord, we need each other every day, every hour, every minute we need you. Lord, and I just ask that you will be with us as we go through our week, that whatever we say, think, and do may be to the honor and glory of your name. And Lord, our hearts break for the people in Ukraine. Lord, we have no idea, absolutely no idea of the horrible things that people have to go through as another country tries to invade and take over. And Lord, just be with those people. I ask that you would 
surround them with your peace and grace. And that this may end. And that the world may be there for these people as well. But even more so that you will surround them. That you will set a hedge of thorns and wall of protection around each and every one of those people. And Lord, now, as we conclude this prayer that was written by George DeVoost, a member of Resonate Canada, which is part of the CRC Church. He asked us that we would pray this in our churches collectively. And I will conclude with this. Heavenly Father, we come to you with heavy hearts as we see movements towards war in Ukraine and have already seen. We pray that you would be merciful on the people of Ukraine and Russia and prevent further this war. Grant wisdom to world leaders to effectively stop evil Allow for the truth to be known, for lies to be shown for what they are, and for evildoers to be thwarted. Lord, we pray for those who have already lost loved ones, homes and livelihoods, comfort and provide for the needs of those who have been displaced. Lord, we ask for mercy and we seek justice. We pray that you would be at work in both. We pray for the day when all wars will cease and when your peaceful reign will come fully. But in the meantime, we pray that you would use us to facilitate the coming of your kingdom here and now. Help us to take action to bring peace, to care for the victims of war, and to work for justice. Help us to live according to the principles of your kingdom today and to remain faithful until your kingdom comes fully at your return. Grant courage to your church in Russia and Ukraine, and here to speak truth to power and to prophetically proclaim the truths of your kingdom, as well as the day of grace that still remains for those who repent. Lord, as hard as this is, we pray for somebody like Vladimir Putin. We pray that you would change his heart and work your miracle of salvation in his life. If he continues in his wicked ways, we pray that you would restrain his evil and have mercy on those who suffer because of it. In all these things, we trust you because you are our loving Father. We ask that you would keep us faithful by the power of your Spirit and that you would be with your church in Ukraine. That in times of war, it would faithfully follow you and repress and represent you before the nations. Heal the wounds, we pray, both physically and wounds of the heart. Reconcile the nations with you and with each other by the power of the cross of our reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray and name. Amen. Thank you, John. It's now time for us to turn to God's Word. I'm going to be reading today from Matthew chapter 4, the very end of that chapter, just three verses, verse 23, 24, and 25. When I finish reading, I'm going to say the words, this is the word of the Lord, and I invite you to respond with the phrase, thanks be to God. Hear now God's word. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ever since Christmas, actually, 
and this is true for many Christians around the world, we've been in a time that we call epiphany, which is where after Jesus comes and is born, we are being just intentional about taking a close look at who he is. Who is this baby? Who is this man? Who is this one who has come? And in our church community, ACRC, we've been doing that. We've been asking that question by just slowly marching through the very few beginning chapters of the book of Matthew. And today, we hear this. We see this. He went throughout Galilee and he healed. People brought him their sick and he healed them. This is what God puts before us today. A number of years ago, and I mean like a number of years ago, kind of way back at the beginning of my time pastoring, I was guest preaching at a church. We read together and reflected on a passage from the Bible, uh, not unlike this one that we read today, actually, that recorded one of the healing miracles of Jesus. And unbeknownst to me, I'd actually not preached in this church before. Uh, they're a congregation that kind of more goes with the flow than I was used to. The man who was leading the worship and music part of the service felt compelled during this sermon that Pastor Brittany should lead us in a time of healing after the sermon was, was over. Um, and so he said so. And he checked in with me and he checked in with the elders. Are you guys feeling that? I was like, okay. If you are, okay. <laughs> anyway, little, new, uptight me. Here we go. And so this worship leader just said, who here in our congregation needs the Lord Jesus to heal them? We'll have Pastor Brittany pray for you. So someone raised their hand over there. So there I went. I had an elder come with me. We prayed. Anyone else? Oh, there was a hand over there. There I went. I had an elder come with me. We prayed. Okay, is it done yet? I'm nervous. What's going on here? Uh, anyway, we were just about to wrap it up. Anyone else? No hands, no hands. And then all of a sudden, this elderly gentleman next to me, he just taps me. Excuse me, he says. Before we finish, could we just say a quick prayer from my friend Bill here, the elderly gentleman next to him? He's been feeling a lot of pain in his eyes lately. Could we just pray for him too? Yes. Yes, we can. So we did. And we wrapped it up. We sang our last song, and we all went home ready for lunch. Nothing dramatic happened, but we certainly all felt uplifted and, and unified. Now, uh, something like two months later, maybe longer, I actually bumped into someone from that congregation in a, in a circle, a, a church meeting, a classes meeting. And uh, I, I recognized that person, and we caught up a bit on life and kids and family. And then all of a sudden, she said to me, by the way, did you ever hear about Bill? No. Oh, he was healed that day, you know. He was healed. He woke up the next morning, and his pain was gone. People brought to Jesus all who were ill, our passage today says, and he healed them. Reformed Christians, like you and I, based on the entire sweep of the Bible, have a worldview or an understanding of the world that involves four movements or four chapters, let's call them. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. In the beginning, God created all things. 
and he looked at all that he had made and he said, this is so good. The world was perfect and beautiful and it worked properly and it was filled with life and health. But then we have that chapter that we call the fall. Adam and Eve, the first humans, sinned. They disobeyed the Lord their God, throwing a wrench into what would have been perfect and working well, and we've all been sinning ever since. God's good creation broke on every level. The relationship between God and humans broke. The relationships that humans had with themselves and with each other broke. And instead of being filled with life and health, bodies experienced pain and sickness and death. The created world itself, the Bible teaches, the environment began to groan and heave under the weight of sin and all of its destructive impact. But unwilling to let his precious creation go, God made a plan to redeem it, to restore it to what he intended it to be, to make right what had gone wrong, to heal it in all of the places it had, bro- it had broken. This is the third chapter in the Christian view of the world. Redemption. God's plan for redemption as I reminded the kids this morning, centers on the coming of one person who would take out that awful wrench of sin stuck in the depths and set the world right again. The Bible's central message is that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, is that person. By dying on the cross, Jesus took on the sin of the world. He endured the awful but just punishment it deserved, and he canceled it out on our behalf. The promise of God is that anyone who is sorry for their sin and looks to Jesus in repentance and in faith is forgiven. And that fundamental relationship between that person and the God who made them and loves them is healed. The final chapter, though, in the Christian view of the world, is called consummation. Think of it like completion. While redemption starts on that level of spiritual healing between God and his people, it does not stop there. It does not stop there. It moves out from there. Jesus commissioned his disciples and then he poured out his spirit that God's plan to redeem all things, his plan to redeem his whole wide world might continue until the whole thing was made new again. The whole thing. Souls, minds, bodies, relationships, communities, the created world itself. The picture that the Bible gives of the end of time is of a new heavens and a new earth with a new restored city. Jesus promises that he will come back one day and that on that day the redemption of all things would be completed. Consummation. Christians see themselves as waiting for this day and as working toward this day. Creation. All. Redemption consummation. Now I'm going to read these three verses again, and I would like us to situate what is happening in Galilee that day into the creation, fall, redemption, and consummation way of understanding our world. Here we go. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, and Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. It's a somewhat 
vague general description of what Jesus is up to, isn't it? It almost reads like a news report given from a distance. Oh, there's Jesus walking around that region. Oh, look, he's healing people. It's a bit vague. It's a bit general. But these words record, actually, a very, very special moment in the history of our world. Long before this, God created all things. Long before this, sin had entered the world. And for centuries leading up to this point where Jesus is walking around Galilee, God had been promising redemption. So this story, this description of what is happening here, and in fact, all of the stories that we get in the Gospels, in the Bible, they signal for us a distinctive move into this new chapter. Redemption is here. The one God promised to bring redemption is here. Jesus heals. Jesus heals. And Jesus heals not just because he is a caring person, which he most certainly is. And Jesus heals not just because he has God's power, which he most certainly does. Jesus heals as a sign that God's plan to redeem his whole big, beautiful world is underway at last. The purpose of what Jesus is doing here is not so much the healings themselves. The healings are meant to point beyond themselves to the new heavens and the new earth. The healings are little mini manifestations of God's coming kingdom, this thing that is on the horizon. The healings are these teeny tiny foretastes of the day when the world has no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. And they point directly at Jesus as the one who will make that happen. People brought to him all who were ill, and he healed them. There's so much that we could talk about together regarding the healing component of Jesus' life and ministry, and it's one of my favorite topics, actually. But God's word for us today is right here. In these few simple verses in Matthew chapter 4. So let's focus in on this and hear what God is saying right here. Four brief observations. First, notice the connection between Jesus' teaching and Jesus' healing. The passage says, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news about the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Do you see how both of these things are happening? Let's not miss that. Both of these things are happening. Word and healing. These two things go together. They are closely linked. We might even say that they are inseparable. The word about Jesus is proclaimed, and then healing follows as confirmation or as a demonstration of the word. Jesus himself clarifies the connection between word and healing in another instance that happened earlier in his ministry, which I find myself thinking about often. Jesus and his disciples had arrived in a small town and one person was healed. And then all of a sudden, news spread, and there was this like giant lineup of people outside the door of the house where Jesus was staying. And Jesus just goes about, and he heals all the people who are coming to him. But early the next morning, after spending a long time in prayer with God the Father in the dark, the disciples are like searching him out, like, come on, Jesus, it's a new day. Check out the lineup. There's so many people here who need to be healed, and we know you can do it. And isn't this exciting? And Jesus is like, no, no, actually. It's time for us to go to that next town so that I can preach there too, for that is why I have come. 
to preach the word there too. To preach there too. For that is why I have come. It is a joy when people are healed, but they first need to know. They need to know. This is what happened in the context of the worship service that I was a part of when Bill received healing that day, to just state the obvious. The word was proclaimed that Jesus heals, and then he did. God's word went forth, and then according to his divine will, God ordained that he would touch Bill's eyes to confirm to him and to confirm to an uptight young preacher and to confirm to all who were there that Jesus does and can, and we ought to ask. People brought to him all who were ill, and he healed them. Second, notice that all were brought to him with every kind of disease of various kinds, This is something that's repeated, actually, in this small chunk of verses. All, every, various kinds. I note especially that Jesus is healing people with both physical pain and people who are suffering spiritually and emotionally. Sometimes we might think that Christianity is about the spiritual realm alone. Jesus is about saving souls. Our job is to win souls for him. But if that was the case, Jesus wouldn't bother healing bodies. I've already said this, but it bears saying again, God's plan for redemption includes all things, his whole creation, the physical and the spiritual, the material and the immaterial. He made it all. He loves it all. The redemption brought about by Jesus must start in the depths of the human heart with our repentance and with the forgiveness of our sins. But it does not stop there. Look at him go. Look at our Lord go. Okay, so in one one way we might be tempted to think what we're up to here as a Christian community is only spiritual, right? That's a temptation. It's not right. On the flip side of that, Christians might be like so interested and so focused in on Jesus' amazing power to heal physical sickness. I mean, thinking of my son who loves superheroes and every other exciting, flashing thing out there, right? We might be so uh, interested and focused on Jesus' work here to heal physical sicknesses, to perform miracles, that we forget to notice how else Jesus might be at work on that spiritual level, on that emotional level, on that relational level, on that level of neighborhood, communities, cities, nations, the world. Physical healing is one type of sign of God's redeeming work, but there are other signs. There are other signs, a heart humbled, a sin forgiven, doubt becoming faith, anger turned to love, fear giving way to peace, suffering endured with patience, a relationship reconciled, goods shared generously, doors opened hospitably, the gospel proclaimed boldly. Jesus does these things too. And these things, too, are signs of who he is and what he does and of this world that is to come. The redemption that comes through Jesus is spiritual and physical. It's physical and it's spiritual. People brought to him all who were ill, and he healed them. The third thing to notice here is the connection between Jesus healing and the crowds following. Healing results in God's kingdom advancing. Healing results in God's redemption expanding. Healing results in God's word reaching farther, going deeper, having a wider impact. 
I had professors when I was in school who had spent much of their lives as missionaries in a very remote and undeveloped part of Mexico. And in the early days of their time there, uh, think of young, younger Pastor Brittany, sort of new and uptight and trying their best, right? In their early days of being there, they were just doing what they knew how to do best, integrating into the community, getting to know people, teaching the Bible. And one day, a young couple brought to these missionaries a very sick baby, a super sick baby. And the couple, the couple with the, with the sick child had already been to the local shaman numerous times, had spent all their money uh, on this shaman to try to get healing, but there was no change in the baby. And so in desperation, they, they reached out to this new strange couple that reads this book all the time, uh, hoping that the missionary's God might be able to intervene. And my professors admitted and I love this, and I feel a kinship with them because of this, they admitted that their expectations were somewhat low, and they were quite scared to be asked so frankly to, to say a prayer that Jesus would heal. Um, but they felt compelled to pray. Of course, right? Because we also know we ought to be doing this with and for each other. So here they go. They opened the Bible to a story about Jesus healing a sick boy. And they just read it aloud. And then they prayed. They prayed that Jesus would do the same thing then and there. And he did. He did. And it turned out that that event was the very doorway through which the people of that area were willing to listen and engage God's word. And last I heard, the church that began there continues to thrive, proclaiming the name of Jesus who saves and looking forward to the day he returns. They thrive. They're probably gathered in worship, friends, right now, as we are. As we are. People brought to him all who were ill, and he healed them. The fourth and final thing for us to notice here is this beautiful picture of people bringing their sick loved ones to Jesus. Oh, there are tons of stories where people who are sick themselves seek Jesus out and they themselves reach out to him and they ask and they beg that the Lord would heal them. There are lots of stories like that. But here we see people, presumably very healthy ones, picking up their sick in their arms or taking them by the hands and leading them to the Lord. This is the detail of my memory of Bill's healing that I remember with most fondness and clarity for some reason right now. It was his friend, another old guy sitting at his side, who brought up the need for prayer. And lo and behold, how great is that to be able to bring each other to the Lord, to ask on each other's behalf for Jesus to redeem, to restore, to heal. The healing ministry of Jesus does not stop on these pages, and I hope that I've implied that throughout this sermon. Jesus gave his disciples instructions, really clear ones, to continue his work, including healing. Jesus empowered his disciples with his spirit that they might have the power to do so. And we have examples of Jesus' disciples in the early church healing. And healing is listed as one of the spiritual gifts given to us as God's people as we wait and work. Although this report, 
right? This description, this little news report about Jesus is from an actual historical moment already like 2,000 years ago. The lives that you and I have been given to live are actually in a very similar place in our understanding of time. Here we are, right here, in between God's redemption begun and the final consummation, God's redemption completed. And until that day, until that day, it is our job to receive his redemption, to proclaim that he is Lord, and to point to that day which is certainly coming. Who do you know who is ill? Which of your loved ones is sick? Who do you need to bring to Jesus for healing? And how might God want to use an answer to your prayer as a sign pointing to Jesus and as a glimpse of the new world he brings? People brought to him all who were ill, and he healed them. With this scripture passage before us, I'm going to invite us into and lead us in a time of prayer. Like the people living in the Galilean countryside, bringing all who were ill to Jesus, like Bill's friend who brought him to Jesus, we are going to lift up to the Lord our own loved ones who are in need of healing. Um, and I'm going to have Dave help. Okay. <laughs> um, this is what we're called to. This is what we're invited into. We are in communication with the living God, right? Who redeems, who heals, and who is making a new world. And so remembering that, we bring our own who have in need. And we ask the Lord to do his work in our midst. So as a gesture of bringing one of your own loved ones to Jesus, and of bringing my loved one to Jesus, I'm just going to open my hand in prayer like this. And you may or may not want to do the same. Just as that a gesture or a physical act of Lord Jesus, we are bringing this one to you. And we're going to just sit here quietly together, and we're going to use the words of be still and know, which the kids already helped us sing once. We're just going to use the words of that simple, peaceful song of faith and trust to pray. And so Dave and Karen are going to play. But let me, let me open us in a word of prayer here, okay? Jesus, we read, we read about how you walked, taught, and demonstrated the good news of God's redemption so long ago. And we claim the promise that by your Holy Spirit, you are present and moving in our midst here and now. Please bring to each of our minds now, Lord, those people that we know who are in desperate need of your healing touch. And we bring them to you now. Let's move into the song. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. 
Father, we thank you for creating us and loving us and for making a way for our redemption. Jesus Christ, we thank you for submitting to the Father's plan and dying on the cross that our sins might be forgiven. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being at work in our lives and throughout the world, turning hearts to God, helping us to walk in the redemption we've received, and guiding and protecting us as we wait for that great day when all things are made new. We pray for the good news, for the word about Jesus to go forth in power today. And we pray that in our lives, in the lives, the churches, and the places where an expression of healing might confirm your word and help it to take deep root, we pray that you would do so today. We have already lifted up to you in silent prayer those we know who need your healing, Lord. And we pray boldly yet humbly that you would heal them. And we pray this not for our sake or even so much for their sake, Lord, but for the glory of your name, that you would be seen for who you are and be given praise and honor. May your kingdom come, Lord. And until that day when all is healed, all redeemed, and all made new, we pray that you would make us patient, hopeful, trusting, and faithful in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let's stand now and we'll sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. this 
steps I had to climb. Good morning. Uh, this week's collection is for Unity Christian High School. Their theme is purposeful and joyful learning. There, um, I'm not sure, oh there is, good, there's stuff there. Um, I checked their website and that hasn't been updated in a while, but then I checked Facebook and they had lots and lots of different things every week, an item or two shows up, some of their crafts they do, some of the work they do in their shops, some of the social projects they work on. And so um, we're really thankful that there is a Christian high school and that they're helping young people um, with a Christian worldview. And a Christian worldview is very important. Everyone has one, and a Christian one to me is very important. It's what God wants us to be and, and to do. So we pray. Lord, we thank you for Unity Christian High School. We thank you for Christian high schools in general. We thank you that there are dedicated teachers that are willing to teach young people how to live their lives, how to think about what they learn, what they learn, and how to practice that in their living. Lord, keep them safe. Be with them till the end of the semester. Guide them. Give them all that they need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand just one final time as we conclude together. It has been good to be together, and it has been good to be together with God. Know that as we leave, God doesn't stay behind, but he goes with us, that his his grace and his truth and his redemptive work might go out from us, from this church and into the world. So receive now this assurance of his power and his blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.